Welcome again, my friends, to Wyatt Park Christian Church. Welcome to also those who are watching online today. We invite you to, even though you are somewhere else, to make yourself at home and know that you are a part of us here at the church. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is not contained just to one place. Thank God for that, that the Holy Spirit is everywhere and can be in all places at all times. And so whether here in this building or at home or traveling, we are so thankful for technology that continues to connect us um, throughout all of our different schedules and, and places to be. Today we're going to continue in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to be reading the last part of Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48, and so I invite you to turn there. And as you're turning there, just a little promo for what's coming up here <clears throat> during the season of Lent, which is six weeks, uh, begins with Ash Wednesday on March 2nd, but uh, the Sundays of Lent, there are six Sundays, I will be doing a uh, pastor's kind of study group going through Adam Hamilton's The Lord's Prayer, and so it's going to be Sunday nights at 6 p.m. here at the church. If you would like to be a part of this uh, small group study, I invite you to just go to the social hall, and there is a sign-up sheet. Let me know if you would like to have a book. I'll be putting in those orders. And like I said, it's just six weeks. We're going to meet from 6 to 7 p.m. Adam Hamilton is a gifted author and speaker, and this is a book that I've already begin, begun to dive into. And this will also mirror, as we go through the season of Lent, uh, we find that the Lord's Prayer is within the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to kind of slow down through the season of Lent and have a teaching series on the Sunday going through the Lord's Prayer. So I invite you to be involved as you are able. But now let us turn our attention to the reading of God's Word, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. You have heard that it was said... Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is a quote from the famous preacher, an author, theologian, G.K. Chesterton, who says that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting or lacking, but it's been found difficult and left untried. I think that goes along very well with today's scripture passage. Like last week's text, Jesus once again comes into this, this Sermon on the Mount with these challenging words. Last week was, I tell you, don't live with an eye for eye ethic. And now I think these are some of the most radical words from Jesus in all of the Gospels. We can get so caught up in busying ourselves with pointless theological debates and end times theories and many pick pick and choose whatever culture war you want as a way to sort of distract us from being confronted by Jesus words because Jesus words here are hard and so I find myself going to parts of the Bible that I like a little more than this one have you ever had someone say something to you that you've had to ask what did you just say? Have you ever had someone where perhaps they said a word to you, and that word perhaps is something that you would have never guessed they would have said? Or maybe they said something that you just couldn't take serious, and so you wanted to know, could they say that again with a serious face? And so you say, say that again. I feel like this is our approach to Jesus in this text. 
Jesus, can, can you say that again? We wonder if Jesus really meant what he said when he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Could there be a loophole, perhaps, in Jesus' teaching here? Please, God, let there be a loophole somewhere in here for us. So today's text gives us the most radical words from Jesus in all of Scripture. It's a command that seems so far out of reach, and perhaps it's one that we struggle with more than any other one. At least, I'll say that for myself. I struggle with this one more than just about any other command that Jesus gives. This is the final section in this this little part in in chapter 5 where Jesus sort of does this you have heard that it was said, and then he quotes something from the Old Testament, and then he goes on to redefine or give us a new understanding of that which was said in the law. And so Jesus quotes from Matthew or from Leviticus 19.18 in this passage. And so Leviticus 19.18, this is what Jesus quotes, but it's just a partial quote. But this is what the whole verse says. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see a possible loophole when reading this text from Leviticus 19? Because what's going on here, when Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor as yourself, but hate your enemy, there's nowhere in here where it says, hate your enemy. And so what Jesus is doing is he's pushing back on this very narrow definition of one's neighbor from that text. He's pushing back on this idea where it says, do not seek or bear, or do not seek revenge or bear a grudge, and then here's the key, against anyone among your people. There's the loophole. And so rabbis and teachers would come along and they would say, oh, Got it. So my neighbor is only those who are among my people. They must be those who are the same nationality as me, those living within the same borders as me, those who look like me, talk like me, those who worship like me. So that sounds good. Because I can do that. We, we can do that. I mean, we have our issues from time to time with those that we are alike and those who are a part of our people group. But it's so much easier for us to focus on just loving those with whom we have commonalities with. Right? And so in this parable, or in, the, in Jesus' words, he's pushing back on this narrow definition of what a neighbor is. Now, perhaps this brings back the parable of the Good Samaritan in your mind. Think about Luke chapter 10, and think about the conversation that leads up to Jesus actually giving the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's the text, just as a reminder for you. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That was the question of the time. That was the question of the day. This religious leader wanted to know Jesus' whole take on this neighbor issue. How do you define neighbor? This religious leader wanted to see if it was true about Jesus' whispers of these dangerous and radical teachings that Jesus taught that challenged this popular assumption that neighbor only referred to to anyone among their own people. And so he wants to know, Jesus, put yourself on record. Who is my neighbor? You see, there would be many would-be messiahs that came before Jesus and came after Jesus, and their goal was to push out the Romans, push out the pagan invaders. They were revolutionaries who came before Jesus, and they spoke the right message. They had the right words. It was a message of nationalism and defeating intruding Roman invaders. 
You see, the Romans and the Greeks, get them out of here. The Samaritans, who were half-breeds, who were once a part of us, but then they became traitors and they intermarried with outsiders. Get them out of here. That was the sentiment of the day. And so the people were waiting for that right Messiah, the one to come with the right words, who would lead a revolution and do all of those things. And so if Jesus was to be the awaited Messiah, the expected Messiah, if he was to be the one that many Jewish people believed would be the one to restore the kingdom of Israel to the rightful owners, then how Jesus answers this question is absolutely everything. How Jesus answers the question of who is my neighbor is absolutely everything. Because Jesus, don't you know that you don't start a revolution by drawing the circle wider? by including more people? Don't you know that you start the revolution by clearly defining who is in and who is out? Jesus, don't you know that you start a revolution by defining who is us and who is them? Who is a citizen and who is a foreigner? Because every king Every ruler, every emperor, every president, every politician knows that this is how you get people energized. It's not by bringing people together. It's by putting them apart. It's by stirring the hornet's nest. By narrowly defining who is my neighbor. You don't tell people to love their enemies if you want to start a revolution. You don't redefine who a neighbor is because we are perfectly fine with our definition of a neighbor. But Jesus didn't come to start a copycat kingdom. He didn't come to borrow from humanity's best ideas of how to rule and to reign and to govern. We've already established this, that Jesus came to announce this inbreaking, this ever-expanding kingdom of heaven, which is an eternal kingdom. It is the only eternal kingdom, and it's the only one that will be from everlasting to everlasting. And so when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we are saying that his kingdom ethics are contrary, and they are superior to all other ethics, all other kingdom, all other government's ethics, Jesus' ethics and kingdom rules stand above all. And so Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus tells us that when we live in this way, that we show ourselves to be children of God. Jesus says that when you love your enemies, when you pray for those who persecute you, you look like your heavenly Father. You can be mistaken for your heavenly father when you live in this way. For God has created this world, as Jesus goes on to say. He created a world where the sunshine and the rain doesn't pick and choose who to bless. That The sunshine and the rain comes upon all people just the same. Because God has built this world of goodness and blessings where all people, whether good or evil, can receive and know that there is a good and loving heavenly father. And so to the religious people that Jesus spoke to, the ones who felt a sense of superiority over outsiders and foreigners, Jesus says in essence that if you live in this way of just loving those who love you, well, he says the tax collectors already do that. He says the pagans, those who you think are less than, they already love those who love themselves. And so Jesus says, what do you do that's different than others if you don't love in the way that I have taught? And so, (laughs) Jesus' words to close out that section, be perfect. (laughs) Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so here it is, probably one of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Gospels. We read this text and we think, at least I think to myself, I can't be perfect. I'm not perfect. These are all just idealistic words from Jesus. And Jesus knows, I can't live up to this. I can't be perfect. The Greek word for perfect here carries this sense of moving toward an end point. 
It's not a, a static, like, I'm perfect today or today I'm not perfect. The word for perfect is moving towards a goal of maturity and growing. Maturity and growing, moving to an end point. Think of some kind of target practice. Think of throwing darts, perhaps. Most of us, when we do anything that you get, you, where you're trying to hit a bullseye, we don't always hit the bullseye. We don't always hit the middle. But we continue to aim. We continue to shoot. We continue to throw. We continue to practice. And the inability to hit the bullseye or miss the shot doesn't mean that we quit. In fact, for many of us, our desire to hit the bullseye in whatever it is, to reach that place of perfection, causes us to continue to practice, to continue to try towards that goal, towards that aim. And so we find a, a certain fulfillment in practicing our craft, whatever your craft is, of becoming a better marksman, of making more three-point shots, or one more par on the course than last time. In 2006, there was a country artist, Rodney Atkins, released a song called, I've Been Watching You. If you're a country fan, you probably have heard this song and you know this song. It's about a dad who realizes that his little boy is watching everything he does and hears everything he says. And so after hearing his son say a bad word, he asks his son, where did you ter- learn to talk like that? <laughs> it's probably from your mama <laughs> or your crazy uncle or aunt, right? Where did you learn to talk like that? And his son responds, I've been watching you. Dad ain't that cool. I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. I need all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. Many of us parents have had a similar wake-up call to this when we realize those little eyes are watching us. The little ears are listening to us, and they will one day grow up to become and look like what they see and what they hear. And so in, in Rodney's song, the dad realizes he made a mistake. He realizes the weight of responsibility upon him to be a good example to his son, And so he takes this personal moment to pray as his son goes into the house. He prays this prayer, an honest prayer, probably one of the best prayers. Lord, please help me help my stupid self. Has anyone prayed that before? (laughs) Lord, please help me help my stupid self. The song then concludes as the dad goes into his son's room at night to tuck him into bed. And he sees his son get on his knees at the bedside. And the song continues. He closed his little eyes, folded his little hands, spoke to God like he was talking to a friend. And I said, son, now where did you learn to pray like that? He said, I've been watching you, dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. And eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We like fixing things and holding mama's hands. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. So I wonder, instead of this idea of being intimidated by the words of Jesus to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect, perhaps this idea of being perfect like our father, could be sort of like the boy in this song. The joy that he had in the process of watching and intimidating what he saw his father do. Perhaps it could be the same for us. That there's a joy in watching what our father, our heavenly father does, and imitating that. Imperfect as it may be. 
because we were once enemies towards God ourselves. We were once alienated in our thinking, but we have been brought close by the love of God, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. You see, I heard one of my, uh, one, one of the podcasts I was listening to this last week said something like this, we made God our enemy, and God didn't return the favor. We made God our enemy, and God didn't return the favor. And so my question is, what kind of revolution would we start in this world if we took Jesus' words to heart? I'm not saying that it's easy to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us because we're going to have growing pains all along the way, but that goes back to the word of what it means to be perfect, to grow, to mature, to have growing pains. This is the Jesus way. It's the abundant way of the kingdom of heaven, and all other ways that we try to go down to will lead to a fiery destruction All other kingdom ethics will find their end in history because there is only one eternal kingdom. There's only one Lord and King above all others. And so indeed, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the Christian ideal has been found difficult. It has been found difficult, but there are many who have come before us And there are many who are all around us who are living in this way, who are giving it a try by the power of the Holy Spirit in them to love their enemies, to pray for those who persecute them. There are many who are deciding all around us to take up their cross and to deny themselves and to follow Jesus. Many who are deciding to walk in the footsteps of the one who is our source, our life, and our breath, and so beloved in Christ. Let's be perfect together. Let's rededicate ourselves to going this Jesus way. Let's go together and let's start a revolution of love. Let us pray. Thank you.